Hi everybody, Joshua Jocelyn here with Truth and Mercy Baptist Ministries here for week number four of our Bible study. I hope we can get a, a few people on today. We've got some very important quotes uh, to look at from the historical record regarding what repentance is defined as by the church, how the church and the saints of God have always defined repentance. And furthermore, we're going to talk about why that is necessary. So, if you're new to our weekly Bible studies, thanks for joining us. We are working our way chapter by chapter through my book, Repentance from Sin, How Antinomianism Disarmed the Gospel. Um, be sure to uh, weigh in with a thumbs up or, or a little chat about you know how things are going on your end to let me know you're here. Um, we're going to give a few minutes to uh, just let people come on in. Be sure to share the event, guys. If you remember, you click the share button, and then you can share it with everyone on your timeline. But also, it's even better if you can then hit the share button again, and this time click invite friends, I think it is. And you uh, then can invite specific friends individually, and that gives them a, a really good notification that we're on now, because Facebook doesn't always uh, notify people when we're on. So this is a great way to help get the word out about our message. Angie Relliford just shared our video. Thank you, Angie. You are always so faithful on these groups, or I mean on these studies. It's great having you here. Who else is with us? Weigh in. Be sure to say hi or uh, you know, let us know how things are going on your end. Oh, and Angie said she invited a lot of people in addition to sharing it, so thank you very much. We'll give a few minutes for everybody to get those notifications, and then hopefully they can grab their Bibles and join us. We're going to be looking at a lot of stuff today, um, a lot of important information about the definition of repentance, how the church, the saints of God, have historically viewed repentance from sin, and why this is important. Why, why should we consider the words of men? Should we only just look at the Bible? I mean, men can lie, right? So why should we look at the words of men? Well, actually, we're going to get into that. The Bible tells us why. The Bible encourages us to view the words of men when determining our doctrine, um, not as a not as the uh, not as an equal part of the of the e equation, but um, certainly as a very important aspect of how we determine the validity of our doctrine. No doctrine is of any private interpretation. Therefore, what is the general interpretation of the of the passage? Who else is on? Anybody have any prayer requests or um, special things going on in their life? I do. I'm moving. Um, keep me in your prayers. We are moving down to be with our church family. We've been visiting. Well, I say visiting. We've been traveling down there once a month to spend um, the whole Sunday with them, about once a month, um, and then just tuning in to their live broadcasts every Sunday for years now. Um, and that got old, and they finally talked us into moving down there. So we're moving from the Pensacola area down to the Gainesville, Ocala area. And yesterday we picked out a little rental um, that we'll stay in until we can find a place to buy. So a lot of changes going on for me. So keep our my family in your prayers. Yes, Angie, no rain tonight. Well, that didn't mean there was no rain this morning. It rained the first half of the day, and I guess it decided to take a break. Thank God. I am tired of rain. <laughs> So anyway, that's my prayer request. What's yours? Anybody got anything going on uh, that we can pray about? We've got quite a faithful little group here. I love um, I love the camaraderie that we have, and some of the some of the great questions you, you guys ask in our group. Uh, which, if you if you're not a member of our group yet, guys, that's Christians for Repentance in the Gospel. It's uh, it's a free for all. Pretty much anyone can post. Uh, every now and then we get a troublemaker, and I boot them out, but. Uh, I mean, it's overall, it's just a free-for-all if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a sermon you want to share, or a meme, or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of great edification in that group. I encourage you to get in there um, on not only just the repentance issue, but also related issues like holiness, sanctification, eternal security. Um, that's a very treacherous topic for some people. They don't, they don't quite know how to draw the line of balance. Uh, the sin nature, um, the nature of the new birth. So a lot of great topics in that group. I invite you to join us. By the way, let me go ahead for those of y'all who aren't yet familiar with how to um, share this event. It's very important, guys, if you're just joining us, to share it with your friends. Make sure everybody's aware that we are live right now. 
and about to dive into some very important information. Um, so here, I'll go ahead and refresh the page and type in the instructions for how to share this group, as well as the link for uh, the book on Amazon. Anyway, what's going on with you guys? Anything interesting? Um, any, anything you need prayer for? Don't hesitate to ask. That's what we're here for. My internet is slow tonight, or at least their internet is slow. Here we go. John Taylor uh, just shared the video. All right. Thank you, John. Welcome aboard. Glad you could join us. Um, if you have any questions, guys, be sure to uh, get those in. Uh, soon, the sooner the better. And uh, comments, etc. This is not meant to be just me talking to my phone. Uh, I'd, lo I'd love to, to get your comments and your questions. Um, in fact, uh, last week, I think it was Theo who asked the question about uh, the thief on the cross repenting. And it was a great opportunity to just throw out a little snippet of good information on that topic. Because that's a very valid concern a lot of people have with the repentance issue. And... I wound up taking that snip and putting it on YouTube as its own little video because that's a, that's a great question. So if you have your questions, shoot them in. I love answering those or looking into them. Um, if, I, if I don't already have the information, I mean, I don't know everything, but I try to find it if I don't. So um, I, I love getting questions and comments and, and input uh, to hear what you guys think about this information. And maybe you've thought of something I haven't, and I, that's why we're here, to share this. John says, greetings from Australia. You're coming from, wow, you're tuning in from Australia. Long distance. All right. Thanks for, thanks for being on. Wow, I think that's a record. What time is it in Australia? It's got to be, what, probably the exact opposite of us just about, huh? Let's see if it's 9 Eastern p.m. What is it, like early morning for you, I guess? Maybe even uh, mid-morning? Goodness, that's quite a ways out there. All right, guys, looks like we've got a few people on. Be sure to get any questions in. If anybody has a prayer prayer request, I mean, we haven't asked that in the past, but be sure to throw that out there. I wouldn't mind praying for you. It is 11 in the morning, right? Yeah, 11 a.m. Goodness gracious, wow. Well, thank you for joining us, John. Glad the, the timetable worked out for you. All right, let's dig in. If you haven't already, please share this uh, live video with your friends to let them know we're going live. We're going to dig into chapter... Three, a firm foundation. Chapter three of the book: How uh, repentance from sin, how antinomianism disarmed the gospel. And I want to start with a very important verse from the Old Testament that a lot of people don't. Uh, they probably would just read right over, never even think about. But there's some interesting information in this in this verse that we need to consider. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 19. Hope you brought your Bibles. Um, don't take my words for it, uh, but I uh, hope you can follow along in your Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 14. Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. I don't know if there's any hikers in, in our group Bible study tonight, but uh, if you go hiking or exploring and you bring a compass and you want to go north, you don't just look at the direction the needle is pointing and then just start walking along with that needle. You might get the interpretation of that direction wrong and you might actually um, uh, you might actually vary from left to right somewhat. So it's important to pick out a landmark, a landmark, maybe a, a mountaintop or a tree in the distance that you align your compass needle with and you find out, you know, you look at north or whichever direction you're wanting to go and then you find a landmark, and you walk to that landmark. Then, when you get there, you look at another landmark up ahead. You line up your needle with that, your compass needle with uh, another landmark, and you continue in that direction. That's how successful hikers do it. That's, that's what you do when you go out and use a compass. And then, if you ever start to doubt your compass or your direction, or you're starting to wonder if you've actually been going the right direction, or if maybe if you're getting off of the path, maybe you're not sure if you're still going north, maybe your compass is messed up, Anyone who goes into some deep woods knows that feeling. Um, if you've ever explored deep, deep territory with a compass, sometimes you can actually doubt your compass um, or your direction overall. You can look back on your previous landmarks and see the alignment of those landmarks with your current position and your current landmark that you're going to. 
and it's a great confirmation of your direction. Now, the, the compass is your final authority, right? That's, your, that's what tells you what is north and what isn't. But how you read that compass is often confirmed or disconfirmed by landmarks. And the Bible says, don't remove the landmarks. Landmarks are a very important thing. In fact, it was part of their legal structure. It was very important that they pay attention to landmarks. And I think there's a spiritual application as well. When I first got into the issue of repentance, and I started disagreeing with you know this Bible study that I've told you about uh, that my friend and I were attending, they were um, they they wanted to pretend that all they cared about was what the Bible said. Well, I showed them what the Bible said, but they always had a way to explain it away or ignore it um, or reinterpret it. Well, the Bible says that that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private in interpretation. Well. What that means is you as an individual or as an individual Bible study even or as an individual church or pastor, you don't have the privilege of reinterpreting the scriptures contrary to the way the Christians of old have always interpreted the scripture. Now I want to be clear on this point. This is not the same as Ro the Roman Catholic teaching of tradition in which they say that church, the church fathers are authoritative in what they say. In fact, equal to or even more more important than the Bible. That's heresy, and that's, that's not biblical at all. But the Bible does teach that the testimony of God's saints throughout history serve as witnesses or confirmation or landmarks of our interpretation of the truth. And that's known as general interpretation. The opposite of, of uh, individual interpretation is general. So no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private or... or um, individual interpretation and therefore what it is saying of necessity is that we should rather interpret it generally as it has been received by the saints this is why for example um, we accept as Protestants or Baptists not as Roman Catholics but as non-Roman Catholics we accept that the Textus Receptus is the proper Greek New Testament why why don't we just accept some random manuscript that somebody discovered in a cave somewhere if it disagrees with this collection known as the Textus Receptus. Well, what does Textus Receptus mean? It means the received text. So the fact that it was received by the general population of Christians as the authoritative God, uh, Word of God means that it is the Word of God, because the Bible tells us, um, Jesus told us that he would send the Holy Ghost into the world, into our hearts, to guide us into all truth. That's the way it puts it, to guide us into all truth. And so there is some validity to the idea that if God's saints come to an agreement over time and over history on the def definition of repentance, for example, then it is of private interpretation to then say, well, it actually just means to turn from unbelief. I know I'm kind of lecturing right now, but I want to make sure this is very clear, and I hope I don't lose you. Let me know if you're, if you're following, but it's not that we are putting the words of men on equal footing with the Bible. Not at all. But the landmark concept of having confirmation or validation of our interpretation of God's words is important, and it is biblical. Um, I want to look at a couple passages. One will start as, uh, let's see here, let me, let me look this up. I don't have it in my notes. We're going to turn, I think it's to first, no, second Peter, I think it is. Let me see here. No, it is first Peter. Chapter 2. Turn to first Peter chapter 2. If you're just joining us, thanks for uh, tuning in, guys. Be sure to share the event to get uh, the word out that we're live right now. First Peter chapter 2. And Peter is writing about, about a very important subject here. He tells us that Jesus is the chief cornerstone of our faith, but he's not the only part of our foundation. This is Bible. This is inspired scripture, so pay attention here. He says, um, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, in other words, if you are saved, if you are born again, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, etc. So he goes on to talk about the chief cornerstone of our faith is Jesus Christ, no doubt about it. 
and no words of men can compare with his when it comes to setting doctrine. The Bible is our foundation. In fact, I have it on my script, on my Bible. Instead of my name, I had them inscribe, still the final authority, because the Bible is my final authority in all matters of life and, and, and uh, doctrine, and etc. However, we are also, uh, as saints, part of the foundation of our faith. The, the saints of old especially. He, uh, in, in another place, he talks about the, the apostles, um, the prophets. These are all stones that help to make up the structure of the house of God. Uh, and we can look to them for confirmation as a landmark, if you will, um, to help us in our interpretation of Scripture. And so when someone tells you that repentance from sin merely means to turn from unbelief to belief, and then you ask them, where oh lies of the devil just shared our video thank you guys that's the valentines by the way great ministry check out lies of the devil and uh, their companion ministry layman's bookstore they're doing a great work for god check them out on facebook and youtube anyway so it is important to realize that as as okay well, i was actually getting into um when someone says that repentance from sin means i mean that repentance only means to turn from unbelief ask them what uh what church founding fathers or men of God can you cite who agree with you on this? And if they're like some of the people I've bumped into, they'll, they'll probably say, since they don't have any, they'll say, well, I'm only interested in what the Word of God says. And of course, you can show them what the Word of God says, and they'll reject that too, because their mind is closed. But the point is, we can stand on the words of men in so much as they confirm the words of God. Angie says, my question how can we have so many different different interpretations, um, even among godly people? The Spirit guides us. Yet so many different beliefs and interpretations. Yeah, that's a very good question, Angie. Not everyone is going to agree on everything, and so the the Word of God never teaches that we should uh, take a popularity vote to determine uh, the interpretation of Scripture necessarily. It doesn't say that majority rules in all things. Um, so in other words, if we were to hold a vote on right now whether or not there is such a thing as eternal security, whether or not um, the Word of God teaches that we are saved eternally, um, I don't know what the what the um, result of that election would be uh, or that vote, and it's irrelevant really. When we talk about orthodoxy, um, the idea that the saints of God can be led into all truth I haven't broken it down to a scientific level, but here's my take on that question. I think that it really is referring to the men of God who we have seen them come and go. Uh, we know that they are true. For example, today, how do you know that the people voting in that election are all born again? On the other hand, you can look at quotes from men like Charles Spurgeon, Lester Roloff, um, some of the church fathers, and see that their lives bore out from start to finish that they were of God, that they were uh, moved by his his will, that, that he was guiding them, that the Holy Spirit was guiding them into all truth. And you can confirm, for the most part, that they are children of God, and that they are holy, and that they were um, accurate and trustworthy. And so therefore, their testimony, their witness, helps to confirm your interpretation of the scriptures, if that's, if that's what it aligns with. Um, that doesn't mean that every time that you, you actually t see a church father say something, that it's true. You have to back it up with Scripture, and even the church fathers were only human. But when you see an interpretation of repentance, in our example, of, re of turning from sin, throughout history, God's people that we can confirm were God's people because their lifestyle was, was, was confirmed as being holy. Uh, and we can see their other orthodox doctrines that are very biblical. Then we understand that their testimony should be considered. But if you were to just hold a... a a, a vote today. I wouldn't trust the results of that election on whether or not eternal security was valid. Um, for one thing, I would question the, the salvation of many of the participants in that. Um, so it's not, the Bible never teaches that we should take a vote. Um, yeah, Lino says that's important. Anything a church father says must be backed up by scripture. Amen. And that's why um, there is a difference between the Catholic nonsense of tradition, if the church fathers say it, it's authoritative and therefore we should take it. And what I'm saying here, which is the principle of orthodoxy, and that's that's a principle that we can find backed up in the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about the concept of having two, uh, two or three witnesses to establish every matter. This was a very important legal principle, and that principle, I believe, 
fed over into the New Testament as the principle of orthodoxy. Uh, we This concept of a witness, two or three witnesses to back up something. Every, let every matter be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And we find many places where this is backed up in Scripture. Um, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and a sin which doth so easily beset us. So in other words, every doctrine that we hold as valid, that we get from the Scripture, because the Scripture is the final authority, should have a pedigree, a long line of history that we can look back on to see that that doctrine goes back to the church. I mean, goes back to the beginning. And here's why. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. The Bible says that God would send us the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. The Bible says that all truth has already been given to us. There is no new revelation going on now. Therefore, from these, we can deduct that, or we can rather induce that, anything that is given to uh, us new, anything that does not have a pedigree in the, in the history of the church, um, is therefore not of God. Anything that is not, not the... Let me clarify that, because not everyone necessarily knows everything. So it may be new to you, but if it's new in the history of the church, don't be carried off by it, by every new doctrine, as the Bible puts it. Don't be carried about with every wind of doctrine um, that comes around, because there's always something new coming around to excite people and to pull them astray from the orthodox path that God has established. Um, and so it's very important that we understand that there is nothing new under the sun. God has already ended the revelation. We've already been given all truths. And if someone wants to redefine repentance to now mean only turning from unbelief to belief, when that's not the way the Bible defines it, and that's not the way the church founders and fathers and saints of old and holy men of God and preachers and pastors of old and missionaries and commentaries, etc., have ever defined it, then that's wrong. And that's... Uh, that's a missing landmark, if you will. There's no pedigree. There's no landmark to confirm our compass bearing. And so they can't cite anyone. The antinomians cannot cite anyone, really, before um, Jack Hiles, unless they go to maybe a couple people from the original antinomian controversy with Martin Luther, who first came up with this heretical idea that repentance doesn't actually mean to turn from sin or that we don't need to preach the law to sinners uh, to convict them of their sin. Um... That is what we're saying. Not that the words of men are on par with God's words, but that they are vital confirmations of the interpretation of God's words. And that is biblical. Um, Deuteronomy also later says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. That's Deuteronomy 19.15. So it is important to have witnesses for our doctrine. So don't let an antinomian say, well, I don't want to hear quotes from Charles Spurgeon, etc. What he's saying is, I don't want to hear the words of God. Because the words of God tell us to listen. Don't remove the landmark. Make sure there's witnesses. Even God himself had witnesses. We're going to get into that. Um, but anyway, John 16.3 is a verse I mentioned earlier. I just saw the reference. Howbeit, when, the, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Um, 1 John 5.10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Now that's the ultimate witness, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's a, the ultimate witness we should listen to that confirms the ring of truth in Scripture. Yeah, here's one that talks about how Jesus Christ even came with witnesses. He didn't come on his own word, but he himself followed this orthodoxy concept, or, or the witnesses concept. He says in 1 John 5, This is he that came with there we go. Someone's trying to call me. Anyway, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Later in John 5, he says, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. In Acts 14, 17, the Bible says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So Paul is arguing here that God has left himself with witnesses to confirm his claims. And therefore, it's not unbiblical 
to look at the words of men or to look at other witnesses to confirm the words of God. Not to override them, not to be on, on the, uh, equal footing with the Bible, but, necessary, but um, nevertheless to be considered as uh, validations or confirmations of our interpretations of those scriptures. Um, and so the antinomian tries to beat down this principle of orthodoxy simply because he doesn't have anyone to quote to back up his newfangled doctrine. His new wind of doctrine that he's using to blow people around off of the, the, tra the trail of truth that God has given us. And so there is no one who you can quote except for a, a couple pagans or, or, or heathens out there who are teaching this heretical nonsense that repentance means to turn from unbelief. Or that we shouldn't teach the law to sinners to convict them of their sins. There, you're just not going to find this as the consensus among God's people throughout history. On the other hand, what the pedigree of this doctrine shows is that repentance has always been defined as a, a radical and drastic turn from sinful actions, whether committed or intended, resulting in a change of course, a sanctified life that must uh, come after it. John said to the um, Pharisees, you know, he said, you, you know, you claim to be children of God, but repent and bring forth fruits meet for repentance. He says, you, you're, you claim to be believers. You claim to be God's children. Where's the fruit? And that is how we see the doctrine of repentance taught throughout church history. So in coming weeks, we're going to dig deep into the meat of what the Bible says about repentance. And we're going to prove conclusively that the Word of God teaches that repentance means from sin in the context of the gospel. Uh, and that it must be accompanied by good works, by sanctification and holiness, or it is not valid. Um, but before then, I want to simply look at the pedigree of this doctrine to see uh, the long uh, heritage that we have of church fathers, of pastors, missionaries, um, churches, doctrinal statements, validating this biblical doctrine of repentance. Um, but before we get into that, Let's refresh the page and see if anybody's got a question. Go ahead and sub go ahead and uh, shoot me any questions, guys, if you want to. Because we're kind of switching topics here. We're going to now look at these quotes. So we're going to dig into what they mean and the doctrine that's being taught here. But I, I, if you have any questions or comments about orthodoxy or the idea that um, it is good to look for witnesses among God's men for confirmation, uh, for landmarks um, to confirm our direction in these doctrines, be sure to get those questions in, comments in right now, and I'll try to address those before we move on. Uh, but we're about to look at some of the quotes, some of the beliefs of the uh, of our forebears, of our spiritual forebears, and I, I wanted to lay that groundwork to show that it is biblical to consider the the prophets of old, the the, the apostles, the saints, as not the chief cornerstone, but still nonetheless as lively stones making up the house of God. They are part of our foundation, and they should be considered not on equal footing, but nevertheless as um, secondary confirmations of God's words. All right, let's see what we've got here. How many people do we have on? Looks like we've got about seven or eight right now. Feel free to, if you're just joining us, guys, feel free to share the event with our with uh, with your friends. All right, any other questions, comments before we go? Angie says, are you an independent <laughs> fundamental Baptist? Yes and no. Um, I am not an IFB. I, I argue that the IFB people are a de facto denomination. Now, they, they swear that they are independent, um, and technically they are, but I grew up an IFB. I was born and raised IFB, and... Um, they have the same speakers, they have the same doctrines, they have the same dress code, they have the same mentality, they have the same politics, they have everything. They, they, all the same preachers come in and they circle around. And I would argue that they are a loosely associated denomination in and of themselves. And uh, while I agree with independent Baptist doctrine, I am independent, I am Baptist, and I believe the fundamentals. And therefore, technically, yes, I am an independent Baptist. I'm a fundamental Baptist. Um... I try to make that distinction. I don't necessarily fit in with a lot of, uh, most of the IFB churches. And I, in fact, speak out quite at, um, actively against IFB churches because I believe they have apostatized and are now filled with unregenerated people. 
um, and a lot of their pulpits are filled with unregenerated people as well. And this is borne out in their lifestyle. Most of the people I grew up with who claimed to be born again, who were on fire for God, who surrendered to mission fields and uh, surrendered to preach and all of these things, they're now going to clubs, they're atheists, um, they're agnostics, they're drunkards, whoremongers. Um, by, the tr by the fruit you shall know them, the Bible says. So I speak out against the IFB churches, a lot of them. Um, Lino says a lot of IFB churches end up in circles anyway. Exactly. It, yeah, I, I was a member of one or two circles growing up. Um, and so it's kind of like a de facto denomination in and of itself. They're, if you disagree even slightly with anything that they teach, they'll run you out. Even if it's just a minor thing, they, they will look at you as the enemy, not as a member of God's holy church. Um, oh, Angie says her phone kicked her off. I hope you, uh, hope you can watch the replay. I, I did answer your question, hopefully pretty thoroughly. Yes and no. I am an independent Baptist. I'm a fundamental Baptist, but I don't necessarily uh, agree with the IFB de facto movement or denomination. Alrighty, moving right along before I get in too much trouble. Let's start looking at what the fathers or our forebears or whatever you want to call them. I, I'm not. I, some people don't like using the term church fathers because it sounds kind of Catholic, and you know maybe it does. I don't know. I I just think we should um, we should look at and appreciate the words of our forebears. And I think I made that very clear in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. Is the pre-trip, JC says, is the pre-trip doctrine a fundamental doctrine of the Bible? It's a little off topic, uh, so I'll, I'll just briefly say no. I don't believe you'll find um, the pre-tribulational pre rapture um, in the Bible. In fact, you won't find a rapture doctrine in the Bible at all. What you'll find is the resurrection. And while the resurrection has some semblance to the rapture, the two are not the same, and I think uh, we should stick with the teaching of the Bible, which is a post-tribulational uh, resurrection of the dead and of God's living saints as well to meet Christ in the clouds on his way to rule and reign on this earth. All right, moving right along. Let's look at what God's people have always taught about repentance. Um, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, we have Tertullian, one of the most prolific writers on uh, the new Christian faith. He actually wrote a book called On Repentance. And he emphasized that repentance from sins was not a work. In fact, it would actually bring about a merciful pardon. And you've got to ask yourself, if something's a work, how can what you receive from it be called mercy? And the Bible does call uh, the result of repentance mercy. And he wrote about this. He said, To all sins, then, committed whether by flesh or spirit, remember our definition, repentance is a change of mind and heart regard, uh, regarding actions, committed or intended, resulting in a change of course. And here he says, To all sins, then, committed whether by flesh or spirit, whether by deed or will, the same God who has destined penalty by means of judgment has withal engaged to grant pardon by means of repentance, saying to the people, Repent thee, and I will save thee. And again, I live, saith the Lord, and I will have repentance rather than death. So he then also takes on the idea that repentance means to just turn from unbelief. He says um, that repentance um, is from sins. He says that verbatim. After de defining it this way, he then goes on to say, Is it good to repent or no? Why do you ponder? I love this. He says, God enjoins. Nay, he not merely enjoins, but likewise exhorts. He invites by offering reward, salvation, to wit, even by an oath, saying, I live. He desires that credence may be given to him. O blessed we, for whose sake God swears. O most miserable, if we believe not the Lord, even when he swears. He says, God has been emphatic on the issue of repentance. He commands it. Why would we debate about it? What therefore God so highly commends, what he even after human fashion attests on oath, we are bound, of course, to approach and to guard with the utmost seriousness. Now here you have a church father who is writing prolifically about the Christian faith. He is looked up to as very orthodox and, and solid in his doctrine in most places. And he says repentance is not just from unbelief, and it is a command. It is not to be taken lightly, and it is not to be removed from the gospel or to be uh, overlooked. Um, there is a statement of faith from 1544 in my book. 
It's from the Waldensians. Now, the Waldensians were a sect of Baptist people um, who translated God's word, who preserved his doctrine, who li lived through persecution, and uh, they are generally concern, uh, considered a pure sect of God's people um, who were not part of the Roman Catholic Church or the Reformation. They were separate from both movements. And um, we should consider their, their words on the matter. They say, We believe that in ordinance of baptism, the water is the visible and external sign which represents to us that which, by virtue of God's invisible operation, is within us. Namely, the renovation of our, of our minds and the mortic mortification of our members through the faith of Jesus Christ. And by this ordinance, we are received into the holy congregation of God's people, people previously professing and declaring our faith and change of life. Change of life? Now, isn't that works? No, that is confirmation that there was a change of heart. Angie says, after salvation and we sin, we have 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sin, he'll forgive us. So this confession doesn't require repentance? Um... I think it does, of course. Repentance is an ongoing thing. It's not just to be... I think it's kind of what we're getting at here. Repentance is not just something that comes before salvation, but it then characterizes characterizes the life of the believer even after salvation. Um, and so, yes, we, we, we cannot persist in our sin and still be blessed of God. But if we forsake our sin as saints of God, when, when it does overtake us, and we confess it to God, then he's just and faithful to cleanse us of our sins. Um, but you can't cleanse someone from a mud bath if they're still in the mud. Pretty basic, right? Uh, William Tyndale, who was, of course, a martyr, a great Bible translator who gave us much of the wording from our King James Bible, he wrote extensively on repentance, and I love this. This is a little long, but follow it. He breaks it down into four parts. He says... Concerning this word, repentance, the very sense and, signific and signification both of the Hebrew and also of the Greek word is to be converted and to turn to God with all the heart, to know his will and to live according to his laws, and to be cured of our corrupt nature with the oil of his spirit and wine of obedience to his doctrine. Hmm. Which con conversion or turning, if it be unfeigned, these four do accompany it and are included therein. Number one, confession, not in the priest's ear, and before, um, for that is but man's invention, he's slamming, um, and he says, so many use that verse, First John 1, 9, but don't ever say to repent. Yeah, it's very hypocritical. I find that very interesting how they'll say that we can confess it and it's assume that we don't have to re repent of it. That's very Catholic. It's not the confession of or the stating of the fact that you sinned that, that opens up God's grace and cleaning process. It's the forsaking of. That's inherent within this kind of biblical confession, not Roman Catholic confession, which, appropriately enough, is what we were just reading about with Tyndale's, Tyndale's quote. Uh, not Confession, not in the priest's ear, for that is but man's invention, but to God in the heart and before all the congregation of God. How that we be sinners and sinful and that our whole nature is corrupt and inclined to sin and all unrighteousness and therefore evil, wicked, and damnable. Boy, Stephen Anderson wouldn't appreciate how negative he's being. I mean, after all, he told Todd Friel on The Wretched Show, yeah, sinners have to repent, but they don't exactly have to be made to feel guilty like they're horrible, wicked, and abominable sinners. Just, you know, little run-of-the-mill sinners. Well, Tyndale would, would disagree with that entirely. Um, and his law holy and just, by which our sinful nature is rebuked. So repentance is, therefore, to turn away from appreciating your sin and rather appreciating God's holiness. It's a change of attitude. You're now agreeing with God about your sin and about God's righteousness. Uh, then, contrition. Sorrowfulness that we, have, that we be such damnable sinners, and not only have sinned, but are wholly inclined to sin still. This idea that man is utterly um, damnable and wicked before God and has no redeeming qualities. That is inherent within our doctrine of repentance. Um, Thirdly, faith, of which our old doctors have made no mention at all in the description of their penance. He's talking about Catholics here. That God, for Christ's sake, doth forgive us and receive us to mercy and is at one with us and will heal our corrupt nature. So he says it's not meritorious. It's not that we have any virtue within us. It's faith uh, of God wrought within us. And fourthly, satisfaction, which I would argue takes place after salvation. And I think that's what he's getting at here. Satisfaction, or amends making, not to God with holy works, but to my neighbor, whom I have hurt. In other words, we're not trying to bribe God by, by doing things to impress him. Rather, 
We're simply trying to make right anything we've wronged in our, in our lost life, in our sinful past. Remember the story of Zacchaeus who said, I will pay back anyone I've stolen from fourfold. That is satisfaction or the fourth part of repentance. This is the, the fruits meet for repentance, in other words. Or this is the last part of our definition of repentance as a change of heart and mind regarding actions committed or intended resulting in a change of course or satisfaction as he calls it. And submitting of a man's self unto the congregation or church of Christ and to the officers of the same to have his life corrected and governed henceforth of them. Church uh, accountability, and that's very important. And I do believe that we should stress this, and uh, especially in our online world. Uh, so many people believe that going to church is uh, not necessary, or that it, being a member of a church and accountable to a body of God's believers is, is important. Well, it is. And uh, that's what Tyndale was saying here, that if someone has truly repented of their sin... They want to seek out a body of fellowship and accountability uh, and to submit themselves to that accountability to continue walking in holiness and not in sin. So let's not hear of this um, Lone Ranger Christianity. That's not in the Bible. In the late 1600s, America's first true Baptist, Roger Williams, great man of God, he wrote, he wrote this. He said... Um, gospel church must be made up of such regenerate men and calls them actual believers, true disciples and converts, living stones. Remember what we talked about earlier? Such as can give some account how the grace of God hath appeared unto them and wrought that heavenly change in them. If the gospel hasn't changed you, you haven't obeyed the gospel. If the gospel hasn't turned your life around, it hasn't uh, saved you from hell either. He writes more on this, but uh, we'll move on to the next one here. Charles Spurgeon. Anyone ever heard of him? The Prince of Preachers, possibly the greatest preacher of the past millennia, millennium. Um, his preaching on repentance is thorough, very thorough. There is no mistaking where Charles Spurgeon stood on this. And of course, Charles Spurgeon was, was wrong on some things. I think he went too far with his Calvinism. Um, I do believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is all-powerful and that God works in our lives, but uh, he carried it a bit too far. However, he was always very keen on being biblical. Even when he erred, you see this, this attempt within him to uh, be true to the text. And so when he misunderstood the text, he was at least trying to read the text for what it said. He wasn't just ignoring the text because he believed in Calvinism. He taught Calvinism simply because he thought that's what the text taught. Now, we can argue about that some of the time, but I do not hold with Calvinism at all. In fact, I have another group, um, part of my ministry, um, and that group is Christians Against the Heresy of Tulip. Um, and so but we'll get into that some other time, perhaps. But Charles Spurgeon, Calvinism notwithstanding, was a great preacher on just about every doctrine you can come up with. Um, and he talks quite a bit about repentance. He says, first, we cannot be saved without repentance. No remission of sin can be given without repentance. The two things are so joined together by God, as they are in our text, that they cannot be separated. Many mistakes are made as to what true evangelical repentance really is. Just now, some professedly Christian teachers are misleading many by saying that repentance is only a change of mind. He's directly referencing the antinomians of his day. So apparently there was, there was still some antinomianism even before Jack Hiles. Uh, he said, It is true that the original word does convey the idea of a change of mind, but the whole teaching of Scripture concerning the repentance, which is not to be repented of, is that it is a much more radical and complete change that is then is implied by our common phrase about changing one's mind. So, yes, it is changing your mind, but not just changing it, not just changing your belief system. It's about changing your entire belief system, your entire attitude about sin, about works, about faith, about everything. Um, let's see here. The repentance that does not include sincere sorrow for sin is not the saving grace that is worked by the Holy Spirit. God-given repentance makes men grieve in their inmost souls over the sin they have committed and works in them a gracious hatred of evil in every shape and form. We cannot find a better definition of repentance than the one many of us learned at our mother's knee. And then he quotes, I guess what was a, a common... Um, Diddy at that time. He says, Repentance is to leave the sin we loved before and show that we in, er in earnest grieve by doing so no more. So there you have it. You have the turning from sin uh, and then the evidence that you've turned in your mind by the turn of actions that follows it. Let's see. Angie says, But there are many Calvinists who are saved and they do have the gospel better than most. Amen. 
I probably would take an old school Calvinist over an antinomian any day of the week. The great 19th century D.L. Moody, who needs no introduction, reading from my book here, um, his quote is this, Man is born with his faith, face turned away from God. When he truly repents, he is turned right around toward God. He leaves his old life. Well, there you have it. Repentance is leaving your old life and all of the sin that accompanies it. I'm just going down a list here. I'm going to skip a few, but if you want to get all the quotes that I've included in my book, you know where to get the book. B.H. Carroll uh, went on to say, by the way, he was a theologian from the late 1800s and a staunch defender of fundamentalism. He said, the preacher who leaves out repentance commits as grave a sin as the one who leaves out faith. Wow, think about that. I mean, he must preach repentance just as often and with as much emphasis and to as many people as he preaches faith. To omit repentance is to... Uh, to omit repentance, to ignore it, to depreciate it, is rebellion and treason. Treason. Now we're getting, now we're getting back to the uh, dagger principle here. You are aiding and abetting the enemies of God by ignoring repentance from sin, because the very point of the gospel is to neutralize the enemies of God, to bring them to the table of unconditional surrender. And if you teach them that they can have the fruits of that surrender without the act of surrender, you are a treasonous wretch, an enemy of God. He went on to conclude that it was the lack of repentance that was actually at that very moment raising up a false generation of tares, among wheat, of, she of wolves in sheep's clothing. And uh, he talks quite a bit about that, but I'll, I'll skip that chapter for, I'm reading that quote for time's sake. Let's look at J. Frank Norris. Great man of God from the 1930s and 40s. Powerful soul, soul winner and preacher. Um, he was, um, he was actually the editor of the Baptist Standard, a very, a very uh, well circulated publication. And he wrote extensively on Baptist doctrine, about orthodox Christian doctrine. And he said this, Baptists preach the gospel of repentance from sin, as opposed to repentance from unbelief or repentance from the tooth fairy or whatever nonsense the antinomians want to believe. It is repentance from sin that matters. It is repentance from sin that is in the gospel. And to say it's merely a, a turn from unbelief to belief is to completely neutralize the gospel and render it powerless. He said... Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There is the one truth that saves a man from hell, repentance. Men don't go to hell because of their sins, but because they don't repent of their sins. I would argue that they do go to hell because of their sins, but I think the point he was getting at is that it is repentance from, or the lack of repentance from sin that is largely to blame with the damnation of our generation. Lino points out, B.H. Carroll used some of the strongest language for repentance, in my opinion. He did. He was, uh, he was solid on repentance. He, he came out very, um, very strongly worded on the issue. Um, yeah, I go into that in my book. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, this is good. This, it's a little longer quote, but I want to read this. This is from J. Frank, uh, no, this is from um, Oswald J. Smith. Boy, he was very articulate and very bold in his, in his points on repentance. Um, and he talks about the creeping in of this, this ancient heresy or this, um, this um, ancient deception. He says, Where there is genuine conviction of sin, it is not necessary to urge, coax, or press in the energy of the flesh. In other words, the Carl Hatch squeeze or the Jack Hiles easy believism. It's not necessary if there's genuine conviction of sin, which Stephen Anderson says isn't even supposed to be used. He says the only people who get convicted of sin are those God has already damned to hell. And he got that straight from Agricola, the original antinomian. But anyway, he says, Sinners will come without being forced. They will come because they must. If they are to get Holy Spirit fruit, God must prepare the ground. The Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit must convict of sin before men can truly believe. It is right to tell people to believe when God has done his work in their hearts, but first they must feel their need. So when someone says, well, what must I do to be saved? An antinomian puts that question to you, um, evoking the language of the Philippian jailer to try to trip you up when you don't say um, believe the gospel or, or, or believe in Jesus Christ. The point should be made that it depends on your current position. Are you yielded to God? Are you sincerely looking for his, for his truth? Are you um, submitted to him? Are you repentant? Then believe. But if you're not, repent. Turn from your sin. Your sin is going to damn you to hell. Flee from it. So it depends on who you're talking to. 
First, we must make sure that people are convicted of sin. He says, uh, let us wait until the Spirit of God has done his part before we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Straight from the Philippian jailer account. Let us first see the signs of conviction. There is another gospel, too popular in the present day, not in the past. It's not an old doctrine, or not too old anyway. It dates back to the 1500s, and that's pretty much it. Um, you're not going to see a lot of church fathers subscribing to this new doctrine. Um, which seems to exclude conviction of sin and repentance from the scheme of salvation. Which demands from the sinner a mere intellectual assent to the fact of his guilt and sinfulness, and a like intellectual assent to the fact and sufficiency of Christ's atonement. And such assent yielded tells him to go in peace and to be happy in the assurance that the Lord Jesus has made it all right between his soul and God. Thus crying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And that's a good point. If you have not dropped the dagger of sin, there is still warfare between you and God. He goes on to say, uh, Flimsy and false conversions of this sort may be one reason why so many who assume the Christian profession dishonor God and bring reproach, reproach on the church by their inconsistent lives and by their ultimate relapses into worldliness and sin. Bingo! It is one thing to hold up the hand and sign a decision card, but it is quite another thing to get saved. It is one thing to have hundreds of professed converts during the excitement of the campaign, but it is another thing to come back five years after and find them still there. So the reason we don't have staying power among our converts is because we've never convicted them of their sin. Lino says, Anderson sounds Calvinist with his reprobation doctrine. Um, yeah, where he says that God only convicts people of sin if they've been damned. To yeah, it does sound almost Calvinistic, the way he says that. Um, Angie says, Calvinists teach repentance. Yes. In fact, um, most... most <laughs> Most of the writers today who are still solid on repentance, unfortunately, are Calvinists. Um, it seems the non-Calvinists have really dropped the ball on this doctrine. People like John MacArthur, Paul Washer, uh, even Ray Comfort, who has not publicly came out in, in um, admission of his Calvinism, but I do believe holds some Calvinistic tendencies. These are all your strongest voices in the modern world um, calling for repentance to be restored to the, its place in the gospel. And they are Calvinists. Um, so yeah, I, I do have we I do appreciate that common bond or, or, or uh, common ground I have with Calvinists, even though I do reject their other their other beliefs in uh, regards to reprobation and um, predestination, etc. But uh, yeah, I do appreciate their. Well, I mean, think about it. They sincere Calvinists want to emphasize the holiness of God, which of necessity means they have to also emphasize the wickedness of man which necessitates repentance from sin. Um, so, where they're wrong, they're wrong, but boy, where they're right, they're right, and I do appreciate that. Yeah, Comfort Lean's Calvinistic, I know. He doesn't want to come out and really talk about it, though, because it would, you know, split up or cause division, and I think he's trying to, uh, I think he's trying to walk up, walk a tightrope, but I say, state the thing as it is. Come out and be owned for what you are. But I am a, I'm very glad for, what's, for what Ray Comfort is doing as far as his gospel message. Um, he surely doesn't sound like a Calvinist when he preaches. In the mid-1900s, we have B.R. Lakin, um, an extremely well-known circuit-riding preacher uh, who wrote, Prepare to meet thy God. He describes repentance this way. He said, Repentance toward God. That's turning away from all your sin and everything you know to be wrong and turning right about face and trusting Jesus Christ as your complete Redeemer. There you have it. The two are together. Two sides of the same coin. Repentance and faith. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, let's see here. Let's get a couple more in. Oh, yeah. John R. Rice. Now, this is interesting. The Sword of the Lord publication is extremely anti-repentance. Curtis Hudson in the, I think, 70s and 80s took it away from repentance. He was a friend of Jack Hiles. Uh, he redefined it as taking, uh, or as turning only from unbelief. In fact, he went so far as to actually edit and alter classic hymns in their hymnal, Soul Stirring Hymns of the Faith, I believe it's called, in the 1989 edition. And he omitted things that talked about turning from sin or um, seeking the Lord. Um, and that was documented, actually. You can look that up. Changed several classic hymns away from repentance. However, the founder of Sword of the Lord, John R. Rice, his predecessor, Curtis Hudson's predecessor, was solid on repentance. And here's, here's what he said. To repent literally means to have a change of mind or spirit toward God and toward sin. 
It means to turn from your sins earnestly with all your heart and to trust in Jesus Christ to save you. You can see then how the man who believes in Christ repents, and the man who repents believes in Christ. They're interconnected. They're, in, they're, they're interchangeable. Repentance and, and faith are often used interchangeably in the Bible because they're two sides of the same coin. You can't believe in Christ if you don't acknowledge your need for a Savior. And you can't truly acknowledge your need for a Savior without putting your trust in Him. Um, the jailer, he goes on to say, the jailer repented when he turned from sin to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes to one of their favorite passages, the antinomians' favorite passages, to say, the Philippian jailer, though it's not recorded that he said the words, I repent of my sin, did repent from sin. He went on to say, what do I mean by repent? I mean to turn your heart from your sin. Couldn't be any clearer, folks. John R. Rice taught repentance from sin. Turn from sin in your heart and start out to live for God, a penitent heart that turns from your sin and turns to Jesus. He went on to say, there ought to be plain preaching against sin. People ought to be people ought to be taught to turn from sin and genuine repentance. That is the founder of the Sword of the Lord, one of the most antinomian publications today. <clears throat> Many in the fundamentalist movement are familiar with Harold Seitler, also a very prolific evangelist. He founded the Tabernacle Baptist Church. Uh, he wrote Chastening and Repentance, in which he said, Recognizing his guilt, there is a turning from sin. Uh, there is a turning to God. The actual word repentance means a turning completely around, a change of course, a change of mind. To think of repentance that does not cause the sinner to turn gladly from his sins is impossible. I know, what, I know that we have a shallow religious movement in our time that will allow men to profess faith in Christ, and at the same time, continue to live in the world. Such a shallow religious faith is not real. Amen, it's fake. He says, these are mere professors and have no part with God in salvation. Amen. Oliver B. Green, uh, over 100 printed works to his name. He was uh, the founder of the Gospel Hour. And in his commentary of Acts of the Apostles, listen to what he says about repentance. True repentance is sorrow for sin committed against a holy God, and not only sorrow for sin, but turning from sin, forsaking sin, and turning to God. Sin nailed the Savior to the cross, and certainly that fact alone is sufficient reason why all who have genuinely repented hate sin and forsake sinful ways. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what God's saints and preachers have taught for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, got a comment from... From Matthew, he says, Matthew Clark points out, Hebrews 6 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on uh, unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Notice, repentance first, then faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. Repentance comes first. You can't have true faith without first having repentance. Now, I don't know if there's necessarily a chronological succession, like, okay, you have to make sure you repent. And then you have to make sure you believe. I, I mean, it just seems to me like they're almost simultaneous as far as the timeline. But in matters of importance, the Bible st stresses repentance first, then faith. Because saving faith is not whole. It is not complete unless it is accompanied by repentance. Excellent point, Matthew. Where were we? All right, so we're talking about the pedigree of repentance, this this pure line of succession of, of doctrine that teaches that repentance is a turn of mind and heart from, from sin, uh, committed or intended, that results in a changed life. That's what the preachers of God have always taught. And we're looking at some of these quotes. There's many more, by the way. I, I'm only reading some of the quotes that are in my book, and I only put some of the quotes I found in my book. There's so many other great quotes. Um, God, God's, God has left himself many witnesses on this doctrine. All right, we're at the top of the hour, guys. Uh, but I want to read this last one from Roloff. Lester Roloff was a great preacher, by the way. If you haven't heard his sermons, look him up online on Sermon Audio. Great stuff. He says, I believe we ought to make right what we can make right. What if I was staying with a group of preachers and one of them stole my wallet while I was sleeping? The next day, he comes up to me and tells me he's terribly sorry and asks me to forgive him. Well, I would be glad to hear that he's sorry for stealing my wallet, but... I would certainly want and expect more than that from a repentant thief. I would want my wallet back. I don't believe he has really repented unless he brings my billfold back. I don't believe you have repented until you get right and say, 
Lord, I'm willing or I'm going to live different from now on. And by the grace of God, you will live different. That is what God's preachers have taught. The repentance changes everything. It is a complete change of mind and heart regarding your sin. It is not merely confession of sin. It includes confession, but it is not mere confession. Um, it is not mere sorrow over sin. It's godly sorrow that includes a, an intention to turn away from it, and it is then followed by a, a change or a turn of actions from sin. And if it is not accompanied by that uh, accompanying, I mean, if it is not accompanied by that action of repentance in works, repentance in deeds, then there was no repentance of mind and heart, and therefore there was no true saving faith, and there is no regeneration. You cannot have saving faith without having repentance from sin. That is what orthodox doctrine from the church fathers, from the saints of God, teaches us. It confirms what the Bible says, and that's what we're going to get into next week. What does the Bible say about repentance? Is repentance truly required in the gospel? I'm going to show you dozens of scriptures, so bring your Bibles. Any other questions, guys? We're at the top of the hour. Don't want to keep you along. Uh, we're, we're at week number four here. Uh, next week will be the halfway point, so um, we're going to start digging into the deep stuff. We're going to get into the, uh, the actual scriptural support for this. Not that we haven't looked at scripture up until this point, but we're going to really start digging deep into the, the Word of God next week. Any other questions or comments, guys? I really appreciate y'all tuning, tuning in. We've had a great turnout this, this week. We've got about 10 people on right now. Um, I love hanging out with you guys. I love talking about these issues, and I hope that it helps you uh, discuss these issues with those in your churches, in your circles of friends, to uh, stand up for repentance in the gospel and exp explain that there are many who say, Lord, Lord, but do not the things that God says. And if your life is not characterized by, by change, by holiness, you're not a saint. You're not a born-again Christian. I don't care what you say. What are you doing? We see then that a man is justified by works. He's not justified by, by working. He, he doesn't earn salvation by working. But we see his justification by his works. And if you don't have works accompanying your faith, you never have true faith. Lino asks, what was the inspiration for you to write this book? Yeah, Lino, I think you uh, you probably didn't weren't here the first couple weeks. I kind of told my story, but just in a nutshell, I was uh, first brought into a, a Bible study where they were teaching this nonsense. My friend and I, they converted my friend over to this, this antinomian heresy. I had never really discovered it before, and so I tried to reason with them out of the scriptures, and I was unsuccessful. And I decided then and there I was going to search this out. I was never going to be stumped on this issue again. And so that's why I wrote the book. And I think I've compiled every single argument and statement that they can possibly muster against this heresy. I mean, against this doctrine. And um, I've refuted it from scripture and from sound reasoning as well. Um, if anyone finds an objection that an antinomian uses that isn't in my book, by all means, send it my way. I don't think it exists. But I want us to be prepared to be able to give an answer uh, to every man for the hope that is in us. Um, so we should be sound in our faith and our doctrine and be ready to defend it. Um, all right, so I think that's it. Let me check one more time to see if we have any more comments or questions. Um, if you haven't got the book yet, guys, be sure to check it out. It's on Amazon. The, the link is in the one of the first comments on this video as well. Um, let's see. I don't think we've got any more comments. Great. Well, thanks for tuning in again, guys. Look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.